we'll look at uh, Genesis and uh, chapter 50 and verses 15 to 21. I read you verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. So here's uh, Jacob then, the last of the three great patriarchs, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. The father of the magnificent uh, Joseph. And he is no more. The last living link with Abraham. They lived together as grandfather and grandson for 15 years. And he's dead. And he's been buried, as he insisted, um, in Canaan. And it was at that time then, at his death, that some of his sons, um, he had 12 sons, and some of them began to express doubts that they had felt for a long time that the wall of protection that had surrounded them while their father was alive had been demolished. They felt increasingly exposed to the threat of retaliation that their younger brother, Joseph, whom they had terribly mistreated when he was a teenager, deciding to kill him, but uh, then considering it was better not to shed his blood, but to get some money from selling him into slavery in Egypt. They then worried that uh, he would want to punish them. And all through their years in Egypt, there had been the guardian presence of this great patriarchal figure, Jacob, the old man, And now he's gone. Who is going to protect them from the righteous wrath of Joseph? And so you see what they did. Firstly, um, some of them began to be obsessed with their vulnerability. They dwelt on this in the days that followed the funeral. How increasingly helpless and exposed they were. And they let their morbid imaginations then run riot. Now, you know where your sins come from, don't you? James tells us, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Sin always starts in our hearts. So, you know what James tells us, the pattern of our sinning is. Each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after Desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so, David's murder of Uriah began in David's heart, and Peter's cursing and denying of his Lord at the fireside began in his heart, and Demas' love for the world and his abandonment of the gospel began with a condition in his heart. And the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ began in the hearts of the Pharisees and the chief priests. And the brothers' united decision to sell Joseph into slavery began when envy filled their hearts because of the favored state that he had with their father. So from what we read here, we know that something bad has gone on in the hearts of these brothers already, before they start to speak to one another. Their thoughts were evil thoughts before they turned into words. And so the Bible says, guard your hearts. All the issues of life come from it. Keep your heart, it says. And then secondly, they told their fears to the others, and they wound up others of the brothers, who I'm sure Benjamin didn't think like that uh, about Joseph, they said, what if, verse 15, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they were accusing Jacob of harboring a hatred of them in his heart. And they were suggesting that the only reason he hadn't already sent his uh, soldiers in to cut their throats was um, the presence of his father, Jacob, the restraining influence he had had. Now that dad is dead, Joseph will want his pound of flesh, they muttered. And none of that was true, because Joseph had gone to God with the grievance that he had against them. 
He had found help from God and strength and forgiveness from God. And he had offered it to his brothers. He'd had plenty of opportunity to hurt them. But that was banished from his mind. Pay back time was far from Joseph's thinking. But some of his brothers then were just meeting and talking around the campfire and looking after the sheep. And uh, when they had meals together, and there was gossip and there was bitterness. What if, they said, you notice that? What if he feels like this? What if he acts like that? What if this should happen and that should happen? Then we would be in a real dangerous state. It happens in churches today. What if he should do this? What if she did that? Nothing is happening. Nothing will happen. But what if this person behaves badly? What if? What if? It is a reprehensible and dangerous attitude. And we have to nip it in the bud. Nothing has happened. But we are judging and shunning people for what they might do. These brothers, you see, they didn't understand grace. Grace is omnipotence, acting redemptively, acting to sanctify and prepare us for glory. And they'd been with Joseph all these years in Egypt. And they still didn't understand the grace of God. And they still didn't realize what it was that had delivered them and blessed their family life. And God's love and God's power had shrunk in their eyes. They were clinging now. What did they have? They had human personality. What a leader their brother Joseph was. They all recognized that. One of the greatest men, the most powerful men in all the world. And then thirdly, they sent a messenger to Joseph bearing falsehood. Your father left these instructions. Before he died, this is what you were to say. That's what he said to us, to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And it was totally false. There was no instruction from Jacob to his 11 sons that they were to say that. To Joseph, he knew Joseph, that Joseph had no grudge against them. They were trying to save their skins by deceit. The fear of man brings a snare. And they were caught in it. And you see how one sin then uh, comes out of a man's lips and he tells another and sows doubts in his life. And it spread and it captures them all. And then they all decide, what are we to do? What if this is going to happen? We send a man. We say that uh, dad... um, sent this message to you. And uh, he, he said after he had died, he wanted us to tell you what this message was. It was all a lie. In the name of the revered Jacob, they tarnished his reputation after his death. They even invoked the name of God. We are the servants of the God of your father Jacob. They reminded him as if Joseph ever doubted that they were the servants of Jehovah. There's no note of contrition here at all. They're simply afraid of their future. And, oh, Jacob had, Joseph had worked so hard to get them to a spirit of repentance. His uh, imprisonment of uh, one of the brothers, Simeon, and he'd imprisoned him um, in order that... Uh, Benjamin might come and that he would see Benjamin again. And then his planting of the silver um, cup, his silver cup in the sack of Benjamin as they went back and the thundering hooves of the soldiers who came and searched and and found it there and the, the returning of them all back to Egypt again. You know the story. It was all done to humble them, to make them confess what pathetic brothers they had been, how they'd acted abysmally years earlier, selling him into slavery and lying to their father, breaking their father's heart that a wild beast had killed his beloved Joseph. That's So um, he brings them, he humbles them, he brings them back to Egypt. It's 
all very successful because they say to one another, they don't realize that uh, he can understand what they're saying in Hebrew to one another. Say, ah, oh, it's because we, we sold Joseph into slavery all those years ago and God is judging us through all these things. What awful men we were. Some of the brothers should have spoken up, shouldn't they? At this time and said, come on now. Come on, don't spread such stories about Joseph. You have to trust him. He's been so good to us. Look at the material blessings, let alone the, the, uh, the way he prays for us. Uh, each one, we've got to trust him and what he's done for us. They didn't do that. They failed to believe the promise of complete forgiveness that the servant of the Lord had offered to them. He's told them, I've forgiven you for what you did, and we're just like that. Troubles come into our lives, and sickness, and disappointment, money, worries come into our lives, and we think, I know why this has happened. I'm being punished for what I did, what I did to her, what I did to him. I'm being punished now by these things. And we doubt what God has said. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christ is faithful. You go with a little mustard seed of faith that you have and you go to him and you you tell him how sorry you are. For your sins. And in that simple confession, the simple acknowledgement that you've not lived as you should and you need mercy. He is faithful and just in the name of his son Jesus Christ to forgive us for our sins. He allows troubles to come into our lives and The troubles that all of us have. Everybody here with troubles. And they are not punishment for past sins. But they are sanctifying agencies that keep us from future stupidity and folly. They are humbling agencies sanctified by God. We've got him... Um, and there's a phrase in it. He sanctifies to us our deepest distress. You know that phrase? It's, it's a beautiful phrase because that is what God does. The Lord is saying to us, saying to these boys here. You trusted me when you first came to me. You were a little boy. You were a little girl. And you heard the gospel and you trusted the word of God. You believed I could help you. Don't stop trusting me now when you no longer have a husband or parents or a wife when things are darker than they used to be. You trusted me when you had some energy. Now when you feel, oh dear, what is my future like? Don't stop trusting in the Lord now. And so you see Joseph's response. And they come and um, he's heard this message and his head sinks. And, oh, what boys they are, those brothers of mine. And they come and when they come into it, they all fall flat. Just see their backs. <laughs> like Muslims in, in prayer. All of them there. There they are lying out before him. And he weeps. He breaks his heart. It's a a frustration, I suppose, part of it. Because he's ministered to them for 17 years. He couldn't have been kinder and more patient and and more loving. And that's been the, the evidence, the reinforcing of his declaration to them that he has pardoned them. And he's shown it now by doing all kinds of kindnesses to them. And he weeps because they've invented this tall tale. He can tell it's an invention and put it in their father's mouth. And then they come and they 
fall down before him and they say from muffled with their lips next to the ground, we are your slaves, we are your slaves. You've got nothing to fear from us. All right, so we're going to look at what Joseph did, what Joseph said, how he ministered to these brethren. And we all need the ministry that he has. And the first thing that he said was to point them to God, the ultimate judge. That we all have to answer to God. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Verse 19. You don't answer to me, do you, as a congregation? And I don't answer to you. We we must all appear before the judgment seat of, of Christ. We go to our great judge every day when we speak to him. God will right all wrongs. God will vindicate the innocent. God will condemn those who escape just condemnation. They've done horrible things, unspeakable things, haven't they? There are men who have murdered women, destroyed them, broken up hearts. There uh, is a body coming home now from uh, the Middle East. One of four or five young men who were tortured and killed. God knows who did all that. This is a moral universe. We must all appear before the judgment seat of God. Joseph was the second most powerful man in the whole world. and He could have given a word and uh, his brothers would have been imprisoned or executed and no one would have batted an eyelid. But... He wasn't God to take away the life of other people. He himself had to answer to this God just as they did. So his question is a good one. When you're tempted um, to seek vengeance, when you stop sending Christmas cards to people, when you stop praying for them, when you show them no affection at all, when you wish the worst from them, my friends, They answered to God for what they did. And you know your duty is to love your enemies. To overcome evil with good. To turn the other cheek. To go the second mile. This is what God is commanding you and me. That's what we are to do. Take your place before God. Find strength from God to live like this. God says vengeance is mine. It's not yours. I will repay, he says. He is competent to judge. You don't know their hearts. You don't know what information they were acting on when they behaved as badly as they did. Most men want God's justice for the people who stole from them, but they want God's mercy for their own sins. We're all inconsistent. We're to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we are to plead for God's mercy on those who have distressed us and and abused us. Pray for them. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that have trespassed against us. (laughs) It couldn't be clearer. So we're not in the place of God. We are. We're in the place of the publican in in the temple, aren't we? Head down, looking at the dust. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. So that's where he begins. He reminds them of the judge. And then secondly, he points them to the sovereign God of providence. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Verse 20, this marvelous, this mysterious This beautiful statement. It's one of the classic verses in the Bible that so crackingly declares the doctrine of the providential care of God, of his people. It was obviously a a mighty comfort to Joseph, what the Puritans would call a divine cordial, because he'd said it, Before, he'd said it to his brothers. You ought to look, it's in chapter 45. And verse 5, firstly, 
It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. All right. 45 verse 5. God had sent him into slavery in Egypt. And he repeats that two verses later. We're still in chapter 45 now. And verse 7. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And now he repeats it. The third time he's told them this. After his father has died. That God had brought him. To these men. Great truths need to be repeated. True sermons on great truth need often to be repeated. For me it is safe. For you it is good. To go through these great truths. Here was the practical application to this in this situation. To these twelve lamb boys and himself. And... Uh, he finds the application pastorally in the tension and distress that there is in the great teaching of the providence of God. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me into slavery. Because God sent me before you. Before you came, God had sent me here to preserve life. A remnant in the earth. Listen very carefully now. It is not you who sent me here, but God. The brothers did not sell him into slavery. Well, of course, they did sell him into slavery. And so we have the doctrine of man's responsibility, man's answerability, and the freedom that uh, responsibility and answerability requires. But behind their decision, there was another decision from Almighty God in saying, You're going to go down to Egypt, all of you, this way. First, Joseph. Joseph could say, it was horrible. Of course. It was evil. You you did evil against me. It was being taken against my will from everyone that I held dear. From my mother. From my father. And being bought by Potiphar. And that ugly, vindictive, violent wife of his. And all the years I spent in prison, they were deadly years, difficult, lonely years. It was so unjust, I never laid a finger on that woman. (laughs) Looking back now, on all those years of pain and suffering, and then the years of being taken out from prison and being exalted by Pharaoh and having my chariot and the servant running before me and shouting, make way! And the power and I had here in in the land. And then I I had a wife. And then I had sons. I can see God's hand in it all. In everything. In you as selling me. In the slave traders buying me. In my coming down to the slave mart and Potiphar of all people purchasing me the lust of his wife, the forgetfulness of the butler, in my uh, ability to understand dreams and know Pharaoh's dreams. And you were coming here just when you did, and I was there, and you came to buy wheat. God was in it. God was in it all. In every part, God was there. God had sent me. God has sent me ahead of you. I've told you this before twice and I'm telling you it again now. God's purpose was to preserve a remnant in famine years that the line is going to come from the seed of the woman. And it's a line right down through um, Abram and then Isaac and then Jacob. And then one day it'll come in the great seed. He'll come and he will bruise the serpent's head. And he will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And we've got to keep that line alive. And in seven years of famine, we came down here because there was food here. Because God had told me how to keep food in the great barns and storehouses of Egypt. And keep me. I take no credit for myself in interpreting dreams or being exalted to power. It was God. 
It was God who showed me. It was God who protected me. I am clay in the hands of the potter. My life has never been my own life. I've simply sought to trust God. I lived in Egypt, in the land of idols. But I had the living God. And I looked to him and I trusted in him. And I can look back and I can say, Jehovah led me all the way. I couldn't have come a better way. God led me. Slavery and all and jail and all. And it was God leading. You grasp what Joseph believed now. Jehovah his God was in charge of all of all that happens to the elect of God. When it happens, how it happens, why it happens, and even what happens after it happens. This is true of all events in every place and from the beginning of time. God does that. He does that for our good and for his glory. But this, you know this, I need to say it again, but you won't believe this. God is not the author of sin. All the sinful actions of his brothers and the slave traders and Potiphar's wife. Their actions, theirs, not God's. Not God's at all. He's not responsible for the horrible sins that have uh, troubled you. The thieves that broke in and took the stuff that was so valuable and precious to you. The folly of the drunken driver that caused that awful crash and the sufferings that it's brought into people that are precious to you. Their sins, theirs, their wickedness, not God's. And yet God uses, uses just hopeless despairing situations and actions. He uses it for, for us, for our sake, for our good. He even used what the devil does. He'll use it for our good. That's the biblical Christian doctrine of providence that the church has uh, placed in its confessions. It's in the 1689 confession. I believe it with all my heart. It's kept me sane. It's kept me going on, year after year. It's kept me from being bitter. It's a wonderful truth. You understand? I'm, I'm, I'm going to come at it from different angles until you're all persuaded that this is what the Bible teaches. The person who stood behind the brothers, when they first put Joseph into an empty cistern, and then had a meal together, and he was shouting out to them from the nearby cistern, saying, take me out, deliver me. And they ignored him. And then they determined that they would sell him into the hands of the Midianites. The person behind that whole scene was Almighty God, your God, my God, the one we call our Father. You sold me, Joseph said, but it was God who sent me. I, I, there's nothing I believe more than this, he would say. God ordained all this. God sent me here. When you were negotiating the price, when the Midianites offered uh, uh, 15 pieces of silver, and you asked for 30, and you compromised and shook hands on 20, God was there in it all. The Bible's full of this. All right, let's look at some verses then. John chapter 18 and verse 11. Little verse, a minute with that. John 18, 11, the Lord Jesus said to Peter, put that sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me. Shall I not drink it? Who gave the cup of Golgotha with all its suffering to Jesus to drink? It was the Father. It was the Father who determined that our Lord would die that death. He gave the cup to Jesus. He knew when he came into the world that that is what is, was going to happen to him. Okay, go on to the next book in the Bible, to Acts and chapter 2 and verse 22. 
It's the great sermon Peter is preaching so effectively and powerfully on the day of Pentecost. And as a result of that sermon then, 3,000 men are convicted and are baptized and become the first Christians to be saved under the preaching of the apostles. It was a wonderful event. And this truth of God's sovereign providence was there in the sermon that Peter preached that had such evangelistic blessing. So I'm not saying that if we preach this uh, truth, then um, people won't be saved. Okay, here we are. Then uh, see it in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, being delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, there it is, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. Okay. There they are. There are those truths. They're lying in bed together, so happy in the bed of this verse. Aren't they there? Godless men, wicked men, put our law to death. The greatest evil that this world has ever seen. The crucifixion of God the Son. No Wickedness can compare to it. Men did it with wicked hands, with a sledgehammer, with a lash, with their wicked lips mocking him. Men crucified the Lord of glory, and yet Paul preached uh, at, at Pentecost that Jesus of Nazareth had been delivered up by the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God. One of the uh, Puritans puts it this way. It's a memorable quote. I've quoted it to you before. I love it. Um, what God sovereignly decrees in eternity, man will always demand in time. What did God sovereignly decree in eternity? That his son would bruise the serpent's head and that in the process his heel would be bruised. God decreed that his son would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. What did sinners vehemently demand and shriek for in time? That Jesus of Nazareth be put to death. It was God who planned this murder of Jesus Christ, the most wicked action. It was men who freely determined they would kill him. What is the only thing that can satisfy the character the nature of a sin-hating God. It is the shed blood of God, the, the Son. That alone can make atonement that resounds in glory. What was the only thing that would satisfy the hate and the passion of that crowd? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. What God sovereignly ordains in eternity, men will choose with their own free wills in time. It's God who was responsible for the death of his son. In the ultimate sense, of course, that was the cup that the father gave to him. He says, is there any other cup? Is there any possibility of another cup? And there was no possibility. It could not be taken from him. So he drank it. What would keep the line of Jacob alive through the famine? The food that was in Egypt. They had to go there. And how would they flourish and prosper in Egypt? They would do so because there was a man there who would give them Goshen. Fine land. And they could live there and multiply there and be ready one day, 400 years later, as a great nation to leave and go to the land that God had promised their father Abram. He would give it to them. And he does it all through Joseph's power and skill and man management and Chancellor of Exchequer skills in ordaining it all in, in the, the land of Egypt. The scriptures make so very, very clear the teaching of man's responsibility and God's sovereign providential care. They're both there in the word of God. And they're both are to be believed by us. One more verse 
go on to chapter 4 of Acts and verse 27. For truly in this city there was gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, this is a prayer, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, the Romans, and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. So, we're not saying, well, who killed Jesus? We know who killed Jesus. It was Caiaphas and Annas. It was Herod and Pilate. It was the mob shrieking for his blood, Jews and Gentiles. It was an execution squad that nailed him and thrust a spear into his side. And the mob said, away with him. God didn't shout away with him. God didn't pick up the spear or the hammer. It was wicked men, the Bible says, that put our Lord to death. They were responsible, but the Bible also says our God predetermined it all. That these things should take place. That this wickedness should take place. That the passages of prophetic scripture should be fulfilled. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Isaiah 53. There it is. The Lord bruised him. God was there. He was there on Calvary forsaking his son. He leaving him in the anathema of uh, guilt and blame and shame as he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. The hymn says, Jehovah lifted up his sword. Oh, Christ, it fell on thee. So what we have in the Christian religion is a plain statement of God's providence over everything, even over evil. And that evil is used by God for a good purpose. But it doesn't come from him doesn't come from the God who is of pure eyes and will look at evil. But he'll use it. Divine providence. It means uh, preservation. It means you and I have been preserved through long lives. Some of us now in our 70s and God has preserved us through our follies and through driving and travel and through diseases, through an attack of pneumonia perhaps, through operations. God has preserved us until now. He preserved Joseph when men falsely accused him and threw him into prison. God preserved him when he was the only servant of God in all Egypt. Providence of God includes preservation. And it includes the way God governs, the way Christ builds his church, the way we are kept as individuals by the power of God through faith and to salvation. God um, moves things to a certain conclusion. His attention is on all the universe. He's not, um, God is not a person who is sitting in the office and suddenly the door bursts open and uh, a, a, a servant comes in and says, Tr- there's trouble in Bow Street. And so then God rushes out and fixes things in Bow Street. He's not like that. His eyes run to and fro through the whole earth. He's, he sees everything that's happening in the world. Now, the fearful m- Middle East and the tensions there and India, Pakistan, China, Asia, Russia, Europe, Americas. God knows now the state of his church, the state of the gospel, where the kingdom of God is. He's in control of everything that is going on. There is not one rogue molecule in all the universe 
that is not under the control of our Savior's Father, our God, Jehovah, the one we've sung to, the one who is bearing witness to us about the truth of his word. He's in control. Now, there are some men who don't believe that God has numbered every head. But God says that he has numbered every hair on every head. Everything in the universe is under his control. He works all things, all things, all things after the counsel of his own will. And aren't you glad that he never steps down from that duty for a moment and that cruel fate or chance or luck or the devil sits on the throne and sends chaos into our lives when God wasn't looking. We once had Elizabeth Elliot and she came to Aberystwyth ten years ago. It was a happy weekend we had with her. With her third husband, her first husband was murdered by Oka Indians in, in Ecuador almost 50 years ago now. And her second husband died of cancer. And this is what she wrote. She said, the experiences of my life are not such that I could infer from them necessarily God is good, God is gracious and merciful to have had had one husband murdered and another one disintegrate in body and soul and spirit through cancer is not what men would call proof of the love of God. In fact, in our experience, there are many times when it looks like the very opposite to God being loving. My belief in the love of God is not by inference or by instinct. It is by faith. She reads in the Bible a verse like the verse before us tonight. And the other verses in Acts and and John. And she believes. She lives her life by faith in what God has said. So you've got to be very careful, for example, about grumbling. About what things have happened in your life. How people have mistreated you. Are you grumbling? at the sovereign providence of God, what he's done with your life, where you've lived your life. You may think you're not grumbling against God, but if you're just angry with people, if, you know, you're giving off all these vibrations and grumblings and complaints, I'm saying to you, you go back to first cause. And the first cause is God. God has permitted these things, these people, to say and act and do what they have done. You deal with your attitude to God. You say, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. You say that. You say it from your heart. You deal with your attitude to God. If you don't deal with your attitude to God, then you will, you may, you may die a very bitter woman. Someone full of grievances. Such an unhappy person. We, we see them in the Christian church. And you're being called tonight to come and stand in solidarity with Joseph, aren't you? And see how God led him all the way and God has led you all the way until now. Those people meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I submit to him and I'm Trust, and I'm, I'm looking. I don't always see the good. At times I'm in despair of how men treat other men, what men have done to Christians. Three grand missionaries in Turkey and the horrible way their lives ended. Unspeakably cruel. And still the trial hasn't come up of those monstrous actions and their poor wives and their courage in trusting in God. I just pray that as out of the uh, Ecuadorian killing of the five young men with uh, Jim Elliot, that it galvanized the generation in the world to take the gospel out to all the world. That would be the sort of good that would come. 
deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. So, some little lessons then to learn from uh, Joseph as I close. And, uh, what we read here is what 50 chapters of the book of Genesis have been teaching us. No, we've not quite finished with it. That's, that's the message. God's sovereign control. God not allowing the, the sin of man and the darkness and the death to have the last word. That's the message of uh, the book of, of Genesis. So what lessons do we learn from this passage? Well, um, belief in the providence of God can free us from bitterness. That's one thing. We get bitter if we doubt God's goodness. If we don't see his invisible hand in our lives. If we don't think God is involved. You know, people are so foolish, aren't they? Somebody has some awful tragedy and uh, we say, don't blame God. They say, oh, come on now. That person wants to know God was there at that time. In the chemo, God was there. Waiting for the ambulance to come to the wreck. God was there. When the lump was discovered, God was there. Let's say, God's in control. God's there. (laughs) God's, and he's doing what he wants to do. And then, um, I'm going on to my second point there, Um, believing in providence gives us a new perspective on our tragedies. It's a a structure. The providence of God is a structure in which we handle grief. It, it, It is not... A structure which gives us ready answers to the question, why? We don't know why a child has learning difficulties. We don't know why we lost our pensions and our life savings. We don't know why God didn't intervene when we were being sexually abused. Most of the time we're simply left trusting that God knows why these things happened. It's a groaning world, isn't it? You read the paper, you listen to the news, you say, oh, isn't that awful? Shouldn't these things happen to us? Aren't we in solidarity? During war and doing, dealing with criminals? Doesn't it happen to us too? And haven't we caused people pain? Who would dare to say to a woman, a woman, This is the reason why your child was stillborn. Who dare to say that? You're not God. We don't know. This is why your son has a brain tumor? We don't know. We don't know. And God knows. That's where God's providence is so crucial. It doesn't tell us all we want to know about the mysteries of life, but it says God cares and God is there. And God is in control. And so we keep believing. um, When it doesn't make sense to us that this should happen to us. And thirdly, believing in providence gives us courage to keep going in hard times. When life is tumbling all around us, what do we say? Life is hard, but God is good. There we are. Write it on a card. Put it on the fridge. Psalm 115 and verse 3. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Well, let's believe that. God's providence, it doesn't answer all the questions you brought here to the meeting tonight. It doesn't make all our problems go away. It doesn't give us an easy road. But it says there's a pattern in the random events that pop up and come into our lives. 
that God is designing something beautiful of what now seems to be just a, a clash of, of different colors. Life is hard. My friends, life is hard. But God is good. And those statements are true for all God's children. And then lastly, uh, believing in providence is really living by faith. We live by trusting in God. Elizabeth Elliot, she had to trust in God's wisdom and power and love. The Bible teaches he's a God of wisdom and power and love. Well, we, we believe it. <laughs> that's, that's the basis. That's our bedrock. And the uh, older we get, the more we understand that um, faith is a choice. I choose to trust in God. It's not a feeling. I choose to trust God. And many times I don't feel like trusting him, but faith is a commitment I make. God's in charge. Our God reigns. And you can trust him. All right, there's a little poem. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul I'm glad to know he's making no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead. For he does know the way. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift. And plain in all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. And in the end, that will be the testimony of every one of us. When we get to heaven, we look back over the pathway of life, and we'll see the twists and the turns and the detours. He didn't make a mistake. I don't know why Ron Loosley should be chosen by God. I can't put it in any other way for his present affliction. I can't think why it should have happened to him and not me or him and not uh, any of us elders. Could have been any of us. Could have been all of us or none of us. And we pray that Ron and Rose might glorify God in everything that happens in Qatar. And that even in these years, Jesus Christ might be magnified through suffering. For Ron and for the rest of us, the best is yet to come. We know that uh, our present afflictions, they're just a little burden. And they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We'll one day stand in the presence of Jesus. Maybe we'll swap old stories. Do we, do we do that and tell tales of long ago? Is that what they do in heaven? And recount God's amazing grace. And in that day, then there'll be no confusion of mind. Our minds will be sharp and purified. and We'll speak lovingly to one another and lovingly of our great Savior. And until that uh, morning comes, life is hard, but God is good. And in the end, we'll say with all the children of God, as we look back on our earthly pilgrimage, we will say, he made not one mistake. Lord, bless your word to us today, find in our hearts because of your grace putting it there, trust in you, that we trust you. And more and more that trust fills every part of our lives so that we trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not to our own understandings. In all our ways we acknowledge you to be God. And you'll direct us and you'll direct the paths of those going through tough times whom we love, whom we commend to you tonight in Jesus our Savior. Amen.